Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the programme that can have all the answers to all of your property related questions. Joining me today on the panel are John Howard, property developer, author, mentor, public speaker and estate agent too, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Yeah, I don't like being called an estate agent. We own <laughs> estate agents, but... Um, I'm unpopular enough being a property developer. You don't need to make it worse by saying I'm an estate agent. I, I, I don't think we're going to let you escape <laughs> that one. <laughs> OK. And um, joining John is Dev Singh, who is uh, MD of uh, Rent ID, which is effectively a property management software company. Sure. And I'd like some more um, titles that I would like to steal from John as well. <laughs> You're, you're, not very, you're very welcome to have not some. Not like Look, he's a, he's a property developer. He'll do anything for a fee. So <laughs> not <laughs> so, 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 so don't worry about that. All right. I'm here, um, aren't I? You're, yeah, you're, you're, you are here. I can't remember whether you're paying us or we're paying you. I, I, I think we know the right way. Oh, right, OK. Right, Dev, I'm going to start with you this time. Um, as the restrictions on eviction for non-payment of rent finish, along with other COVID easements, do the panel think that tenant evictions will return to the normal process? Or is the overall system likely to be reviewed and made easier post-COVID? I think there was already issues in the system anyway. That's why they were looking at this uh, renters reform bill before it all came along. Given what happened in COVID, I don't think there is any way of going backwards. There is an, you've, the system's overwhelmed with rent debt and this rent debt crisis is coming whichever way we look at it. The assistance that was provided was abused to a certain extent or was moved in ways that it shouldn't have. And what's, what's come together is a lot of tenants are going to find them situ in a, some, themselves in a situation that they didn't expect to be in, essentially being evicted from the property. Landlords also didn't want to. They took advantage of certain leniency or, or payment holidays. So I don't think there is a way back. There is only a new norm. And I'm sorry to use a, a, a term now, but that's what's been thrown around. So, yes, there's going to be changes. It needs to happen. And the only way that's going to be is by providing possibly security for tenants moving forwards. I want to be very careful here about saying give further assistance to tenants because I don't know whether, again, that will push them into further debt. And landlords at the same time, genuine landlords are suffering because they haven't had a rental income. Mortgage payments are going to, you know, start again. Everything's, nobody's going to keep on holding. The market can't stay like this. So I think the government will move to help and will move to change legislation. How well they do, I don't know. <coughs> Dev, I understand that, you, you know, effectively you, you, your specialism is in um, residential uh, property rather than commercial. But I was a bit disturbed the other day. I sort of read in the papers that what a number of commercial landlords are doing um, to get round this COVID restriction on, on, on the limitations of their action during the period, they're ignoring the normal um, repossession process through the county court and they're taking the rent debt to the high court, mm. getting judgment mm. and then asking the high court to enforce yeah. a control well, I, order over getting the property but, but, back or whatever. I, I, I honestly don't blame them. You know, I've got shops that I can't even talk to the tenants yet. It's been, they still haven't reopened. But John, it's crazy. What, 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 what sort of percentage in terms of tenants do you think, how many of, in percent terms do you think those tenants are delinquent tenants and how many are just genuinely suffering? See, that's the thing. I think, it, they're, I think they're hidden, aren't they? Because it's plenty of people are claiming, and I think we'd be put in a position to answer something that we just don't know. Mm. Well, I would say people have abused yeah. some help. But mm. there's some very genuine people that needed the help. I think I think it's very I think it's very difficult, and I think this government. And the more the more I hear about this government, the more I think that they're, they're, they're virtually the lab, Labour government in, in 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 wolf's clothing. I mean, the more they they're helping these tenants and everyone else so much, and they're not helping their landlords. Mm. I mean, it's it's just. They're so desperate for votes. They're well, so John, desperate you, to you say, please everybody. You say that. I'm very disappointed. I might have to make a phone call. Well, yeah, well I was just going to say you might or a want text to. Text message. You want to say, yeah, text message. That might be better. I don't want to abuse, abuse my contacts, but yeah. really, it, it, it does, it does just, frustrate me. But, John, you see, you say the government are helping. Yeah. Um, hold on a tick. We've just taken £300 billion worth of borrowing this last, last 12 months, and it's you, I, and everybody else, the taxpayer, that's going to be paying this back. 
this, you know, we, we, we say this, um, Dev, a lot. You know, at the end of the day, it, it's only a certain amount of people in the UK, you, me, Stephen, and the likes, who are paying the tax. Because if you're if you're young, you don't. In you're young, you don't pay. If you're old, you're retired, you don't pay. It's the middle section. It's all of us paying huge amounts of tax in this country. Yeah, Dev, it's your question. Come on, a bit more. Oh, I can't disagree with anything that's been said, but um, yeah, in regards to reform and in, in regards to you know your question about delinquent how are you going to ascertain and I can't speak on the commercial element it's not something I, I'm aware of it very much I've got you know uh, people I work with day to day on commercial elements but in the residential format there has to be a change and there has to be a there has to be a whole switch up on what's going to be the assistance that's going to be provided do you, do you think the whole sort of lease system will change it has to it's not a matter of do I think it's going to change it has to how has it worked so far we weren't ready for anything nope the world wasn't ready for what happened no. last year so how are we going to go back to something that we know could affect us again? And this may include, as you said, people are using high courts to bypass now and go things. There needs to be specialist uh, procedures uh, put know, in place. It's very for difficult. The one thing I would say is, as a landlord of, and, and owning quite a few properties, residentially, I thought that we, were, the, we would only get, say, 70% of our rents in. And actually, we got about 95% of our rents in you know, during COVID. So that's surprised everyone. I think most yeah. people were the same, yeah. which is great. Commercially, my goodness, luckily I don't have well, that much pro, pro rata, that much commercial. You'll always have somebody wanting to hang on to their home a lot more than they will do yeah, a commercial Yeah, I, I understand that. I understand that, yeah. That's very true. Good point, Stephen. Um, yeah. But it, it, it is a difficult period, and I, I, I worry, I mean... Like, like everything else in life, there's good landlords, there's bad landlords. For sure there are, yeah. And I, I think in the main, I, I see some of the big commercial landlords have been quite reasonable with their yes, tenants. They have, they, they've yeah. set aside some rents, they've deferred some rents. But of course, we've now got to go through the period of catch-up. We and have. That, and that may not be quite so easy as some people think. No. Because I, I don't know really, for these first few months out of lockdown, how, how much the business environment has changed. How, how much mm. will it be? Will there really be a boom once we get over the privilege, think, as you would say, of, of um, being allowed out of our home? Yeah. I mean, I, what I would say on that, I think till September, there's going to be a mini boom. Lots of money. You know, £100 billion has been saved in the UK. That's going to, some of that's going to be spent. I think the problems start in September onwards when we, when, when we have the furlough and everything else come off. And I know that a number of MPs and the government especially, oh, I know the government have done a lot of work on this and they believe there'll be a lot more bankruptcies than usual after September. Mm. Well, and again, I read in the papers that, you know, bankers, bankruptcy, I think, used to last for about three years or something. Now they're saying that, uh, that provided there's no criminal element or deceit involved, you can be out of bankruptcy within three or four months. So, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But would that encourage people to yeah, take that option? It's very difficult. Well, I don't know. I think... Because I also read articles where people have opted, closed down companies which are responsible for rentals, or responsible for properties and sell, and the money's money. disappeared too. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. again, you know, this is where... But you see, if you, if you look at the figures again, on, on, on these bounce back loans, I, I can't, it was an astronomical percentage that they were saying were actually fraudulent. Mm. So... Well, they think 30% of, of the bounce back loans won't get repaid. Mm. That's what they're saying. All right, thank you, Deb. John, your question. Yes. Do the experts think that the decline of specialist lending by building societies since the 1980s has seen a decline in affordable lending for young people? It seems that mainstream bank lending is far more prone to changes and is influenced by the bank's desire to satisfy shareholders' dividends and market trends rather than a socially essential service. Goodness me, there's someone very intellectual um, sending in these, some of these questions, aren't there? Must these be. Days. Um, because well, that, it's is, the, that is a very, a very... It's the quality of our viewers. It's the quality of your viewers. Um, what they're saying is, is, is there's less specialist lenders now than there was in, in the 1980s, well, uh, which well, we uh, both remember. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure that's right, is it? I mean, for me... Um, the clearing in the 1980s, the clearing banks did everything, didn't they, Stephen? So the clearing banks would lend. You don't know this because you're far too young. <laughs> but in the but but in those days, the clearing bank. If you were a property developer, for instance, you would go to the clearing bank. They would lend you 50 percent, maybe 60 percent, and they lend you 60 percent or 50 percent of the refurbishment costs or the build costs. 
so you had to have a very large deposit. Nowadays, there's all these thousands of uh, small banks and lenders. They're really bridges, in my view, where they're lending money at 7 to 10%. They'll do 70% of the purchase price, and they'll do all the bill costs. That's the modern way. But you're going slightly off piece here, John, because this is talking about building societies. I'm just getting there, because okay. some of them are right. building societies. I'm just getting to the building societies. Be patient. And, of course, there aren't that many building societies now, because they've all converted to banks, by the way. That's the point. There's some. So the genuine um, building societies in this country uh, are, are less and less and less because they've, t they've turned over to be banks with shareholders and so on, and that is right. However, I would say um, they are more forward-thinking uh, and, and more diverse in how they lend now than they did in the 1980s. Because in the 1980s, if you remember, the building society manager would come, would, you'd, you'd go and see the building society manager in your local town, you had to sit there, fill out the forms to get your mortgage. He'd then know, he'd then, or she would know the, um, the person you work for and would speak to them and say, oh, is he okay? And we'll let, That's how it happened. Now you can do it on, online. <laughs> yeah, instantly but you that, get a mortgage. But that time in the 80s was when we had a switch from that kind of yeah. lending. Building societies wanted to turn themselves into banks. And on top of which, we started to adopt this American system of, 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 of point assessments for lending, didn't we? You, we did. But don't forget, in the 1980s, and you won't believe this, I'll tell you now, many building societies would not lend on a converted flat. That's how rigid they were. That's I true, would yeah. say they're less rigid now. They're more flexible. Yes, they, they all tend to specialise a little bit in different things. But I, I'm, I'm, I, I, it's obviously a very intelligent person's written that uh, question, sent it in by email to us. But for me, I think he's wrong or she's wrong. OK. Dev? I think that there's a lot out there and I don't think it's... I don't think you're limited. If you're looking in the right places, I think there is specialist lending. I don't, I, and again, I'm, I apologise, I don't have the comparables that you have. Do you, not, do you not think that these days the banks have had their balance sheets strengthened at the cost of young people having to put big deposits down on, on mortgage lending, oh, borrowing? But again, speaking from my own personal experience, why shouldn't you, this is no, you know, not in dispute with what you're saying, but why shouldn't you have to have a decent sized deposit? Just it's about risk. Wrong. You're wrong. I don't, <laughs> I don't fully disagree. I but, doubt that for a minute. <laughs> but I wouldn't say that. Why shouldn't you be committed to what no. it is? And a bank should. I it's a risk element. I think what I take issue with is is that, that it was the American sub prime market yes, that caused agreed. all the yeah. trouble here. Yeah. It wasn't the fault of our young kids having 100% more. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. I agree, I agree entirely. But anyway, we can agree on that. On that note, agree we're going to, we're going to have a break. So I'm Stephen Galpin. I'm with John Howard and Dev Singh. Join me after the break. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and joining me are John Howard and Dev Singh. Welcome back, gents. Uh, Dev, your second question. What's the panel's advice for a fairly new buy-to-let landlord with regards to property management? I'm leaning towards doing it myself, but the law seems to be a bit of a minefield and I'm worried I won't have a full enough knowledge of the regulations and my legal requirements and obligations. So you know where I'm going to go? I'm going to go pro self-management. I think I know where you Always. Going. Yep. Um, and for reasons. Obviously, legislation is always changing, but are they honestly saying that self-management compared to, uh, I'm very aware that John's looking at me right now, compared to a, <laughs> uh, an estate agent or a specialist is better? Shouldn't you be aware when you're buying a property for a buy-to-let purpose of what you're essentially responsible for always? Doesn't matter whether you have put an agent or a broker or a consultant in the middle, the landlord is always responsible. Mm. Disrepair, maintenance issues, an issue with the tenants, health and safety, anything will always come back to the, uh, to the landlord themselves. Well, you're the car dealer, aren't you? That's, that's the problem as a landlord. Everything's your fault. Handle drops off, your it's, fault. Washing it's there, the, but uh, again, I think, I think a, I, again, um, John's looking at me, with the agencies or with anybody else, this is not, there's some very competent people out there which know what they're doing, but they create an area of 
uh, let's call it a grey area, where the landlord will be the focus. Because by the time the landlord is aware of the problem, the problem's already escalated. Mm -hmm. So self-management is the only way forward. Of course you should self-manage. There's, I think, 150 pieces of legislation out there um, to do with what a landlord needs to be aware of. You know, and then it goes into specialists like service accommodation or HMOs and, and so forth. But why shouldn't you? If you're making that step and purchasing a property and take an active approach, this property is going to equal something later on in your life, whether it's your retirement plan or whatever it is, it's an income. So why shouldn't you be aware of everything that it encompasses? From the point of view of gaining the knowledge of legislation or regulations, I suppose, even more so with HMOs, which are quite complex, I think. Um, what would you say? Would you go the software route for this, of self-management software? Would you go research on the internet? Would you go to your local authority for guidance? So I would do... I, I'm sorry, I, I just qualify that, what I just said to you. And I, I, I say that local authority because, I, I, again, we've been reading that local authorities are bringing in their own local bylaws and, and regulations to really crack down on what they call rogue landlords. And they're right to do so. And I think right? that's, absolutely that's absolutely right, right isn't absolutely. it? In London yeah. especially, I mean, it changes from street to street in some cases. Mm -hmm. So um, you should do a mixture of everything. You should have a, you should turn to software, right? The world has changed. It's absolutely the way forwards. Why shouldn't you have something that's on your, your, your device or, or something that you have transparency and retain some control? In respect of turning to specialists, you should look out there for specialists. Now, if you're in a in a good position that you can turn to someone you know or someone that's recommended to you, an individual or a company, go seeking that advice. Whether it is a, you know the actual local council, in regards to the HMO licensing for that particular area, but you should always keep that control with you. You should absolutely keep that control. You shouldn't. You shouldn't let go of that at any point. I don't know whether Mr. Howard's going to go a different way here. I. I'm sounding a little bit of a dinosaur because of all this online stuff and, 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 and it's so clever what you can do now, all these online portals and so on. It's amazing. I was told the other day uh, that 10 million people view a property portal every month in this country. 10 million people. It's remarkable. What I would say, it's a little bit like running a restaurant. If you run a restaurant and buy a restaurant, and why do successful people want to buy a restaurant? I do not know, but they do. And the one thing they can never do is cook in the kitchen. So if the chef walks out, they've had it. Mm. What is important, I would say, e whether or not you're going to use a managing agent or you're going to do it yourself, it's very important that you learn to do it yourself because actually, You've got to judge other people, you may you? have to yeah. do that. So it's a bit like the restaurant scenario for me. Is you know Why would you buy a restaurant if you can't cook yourself? The chef walks so out and you're stuck. So you're a good cook then? Sadly not. Oh, okay. No. Uh, well, I've got a friend that owns a restaurant, and he tells me he has two hundred people in a day that all seem to know how to cook better than he does. Yeah. But you know, I'll, we should definitely visit. <laughs> <laughs> we should <laughs> all on all on Stephen. <laughs> yes. Well, we'll we'll come to Ipswich and um, some great restaurants in Ipswich. Right. Okay. So, so John, you, 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 what is your feeling? Do you think? Do you think so? My feeling is the mod, the modern way clearly is to is to look to rent to, to to manage it yourself. And even if you decide not to do so, I think learning how to do it is very important because if you're not happy with the with your management company, you, you've got the confidence then to say, I'm going to do it online. I can do it myself. Thank you very much. I don't need you. So either way, I think you should learn how to do it. John, something I want to ask you, um, I, and I'll, I'll say before I ask it, um, you're a great contributor to this to this channel. Thank you. Um, we're always very pleased to have you on. Your, your advice is always very balanced, and but? Uh, and you have no, not yet, <laughs> not, not quite. Um, and, and you have a broad knowledge of the property market, which is which is very helpful for our viewers. But I see a lot of these adverts where people are encouraged or enticed to go to seminars where people yeah. speak and I know that's something that you do. Um, I've read your books and I have a respect for what you do and I know what your track record is so th that's fine, I'll take you out of this equation. But I wonder how somebody new to buy to let or new to the property market evaluates the worth of those people speaking and Absolutely. lecturing. It's overwhelming how much it, there is out there it, it is and, and how expensive it can be. Expensive, yeah. but also how it has no value or at relevance the end of it. in certain cases. That's what the I, problem. Yeah. So what how, I, do you, how do you judge it? What I would say is there's an awful lot 
uh, free advice out there, an awful lot of free advice. And I would start off with the free advice. Get, get a feel, get to know what you want to do, how you want to do it in the first place without spending any money at all. And ask people um, and ask people their advice, and also search people online. You know, if you're looking to take advice and someone wants to be paid for that advice, it's so easy these days. You know, to just just go online and see the reviews and see what people say, because there'll be someone out there that suits you. Mm. You know, can work with you. Um, but I agree, the, the the big money for these uh, week events and stuff like that and yearly events, you know, where you, you see them once a month and they charge 20, 30,000 pounds, I think is complete madness. But you've got a lot of online, as I said, and I, I'm pro management, pro software. Yeah. But again, I would do the same thing. I would definitely understand the team behind those systems. Very much so. Because, yeah. okay, in this world, you could have someone that's just involved in a certain aspect and they're only coming at that aspect. John has years of experience. You have years of experience to put into something. If you were to write something today, whether you claim to be technical or not, you would bring that experience to the plate. And I think it's important that the team backing anything, whether it's software or a traditional route, have the relevant experience because that's where it falls short. You can't access that wealth of knowledge as a new person to the buy select market, whether you're going through a software or whether you're going through a person itself, and everything's available online. It doesn't take much to research and find out who's behind the product, who's behind the service, and then make a judgment call, just like you're doing with your property. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, John, your final question then. All right, that's, I, I, I seem to have spent most of my life trying to deal with this next one here that you're going to be asked. Why is it when valuers come to value a property for mortgage purposes, they rarely value at a figure close to the selling or buying price? despite the fact that there might be similar properties in the vicinity that have sold at a higher figure? Well, I've got a bit of sympathy for some of these valuers, which you might be surprised to hear. I am. Uh, uh, <laughs> and, and, and many times I haven't had, but as I, I've got older, I think, I, I think I, I've got more. I think, they got, should, I think they should all be buried behind plasterboard yeah. walls at birth. At so level. what you've got to remember <laughs> is, is depending, it depends on the instructions they are given by the bank. If the banks say to them, I want this valued on the basis of it, that we could sell it within 28 days, for instance, then they're likely to value it less than the market value. If they say, well, I want you to value it on the basis it's going to be sold within three months, they will probably come up with a market value. That's the, the simplest answer I can give you. Now, in every line of business, there are people that aren't very good at what they do. And actually, there is a great argument now and I'm sure you would agree with this, Fab, to not even bother going to look at these properties. Most of these valuations can be done on desktop. Uh, there's so much research out there. You can go, you know, you can actually see the property physically online and everything else. In most cases, it's a waste of time. They valuers know what they're going to value it at. If you've got a three bedroom semi, you know, in a street where the next door sold for, you know, 245 and yours is on at 250, you know, first of all, 10% is always personal opinion in my view anyway. So, you know, there isn't any really any need for these values to go out and value. Different if it's the development or if you're looking to develop a project or, or new build, that's different. But for the average uh, property buyer who's buying a property on the open market with an agent, I don't think it'll be too long before building societies and other lending institutions won't send out a valuer. That will all be done on the data and so on. The only proviso is whether or not that property's got a crack in it. Mm. If it's got structural problems, the totally different game. But, but usually a, a, a mortgage valuation won't even look at whether it's got any structural problems, will it? Well, people ask me all the time, well, shall I get a detailed survey done? I said, no, let the building society guy go out first. If, if they see a crack or a problem, they'll report it and they'll want, to, they'll want a specialist report on it anyway. They're, they're, like a, they're like a general practitioner doctor. They know a bit about everything and not a lot about one particular subject. So they're never going to sign their lives away. You know, they're defenders. They're not attackers, they're defenders. So all they're ever going to do, if there's a crack in it, it's, oh, you need specialist report. That's it. That's what you've got to remember. Come on then, Dave. Mm. 
I kind of agree with your point at the beginning. I've never come across a valuer that has been fair to the valuation that needs to be done. And I'm, I'm again, pro well, online. I, However, I, I'll tell you what I think, and it's is, this. I think, I think there are a lot of valuation companies, surveying companies, that do these bulk deals with lenders for doing a valuation for £100, £150, yeah, instead of a 1000 quid. And what do they do? They undervalue like mad, because what our viewers should know is that a valuer can be sued if he overvalues your property and you, and you then default. So what do they do? They undervalue, so they go nowhere near their PI insurance and can sit there and make mistakes but surely all day long. And Surely that's not what they should be doing. No, right? it's not what they should be doing. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times down here in, in Canary Wharf they say, oh, well, there's so much coming on the market. You know, we've got but to take that But that does thing. have an effect, to no, be fair no, to them, John, Stephen. On, on Rick's regulations, they have to value as of today, not about what's going to happen in the future. And that's sometimes the difficulty. But they do the valuation, OK, so they build mm. the buffer in, OK, so they yeah. downvalue the property. I don't think we've got, anybody's got a problem with downvaluing slightly. But then the bank will only lend you a portion of that, so the risk element down is, again. Yeah. is built in. So yeah. when it comes to a mortgage, you suddenly, and it goes back to other questions, you're suddenly put in a position to raise your deposit. Do you know, and do you know what? With my joint venture fund that I've got, we invest in other people's property deals, and I'm more interested in, in investing in the person than I am the property. John, on that note, I'm going to have to stop you there. Thank you both very much indeed. John Howard, Dev Singh, thank you both for your contribution. It's been very interesting, this show. Thank you. That's all we've got time for today. So I'm Stephen Galvin. Join me next time on Property Question Time.